good day. My name is Paul Wax. I'm the uh, executive director of the American College of Medical Toxicology, and I'd like to introduce everyone to our webinar series, The Medical and Public Health Considerations of COVID-19. Today, we're going to have a, a special presentation entitled COVID-19, The Neurological Manifestations and Global Impact on Stroke Care. Uh, next slide. I'd like to thank our webinar series partners for getting the word out about our uh, webinars. Next slide. Um, uh, this webinar will be recorded and placed up on our website. Uh, we've been doing this pretty much weekly since uh, March. We have quite an uh, accumulation of uh, excellent uh, uh, webinars at this point. They're all available uh, on demand, and, and the residents will be getting an email about uh, the uh, recording uh, on Friday. Next slide. Uh, there will also be a Q&A at the end of the webinar. We usually try to leave about 15 to 20 minutes for the, for the Q&A. So please type your questions into the Q&A function. Um, on, uh, um, on, on the Zoom platform, or for those of you on YouTube, you can uh, type it into the chat function, and we'll try to get to as many uh, of the questions as possible. Uh, next slide. Uh, we also have developed a series of uh, FAQs on a variety of our webinars, and this can also be uh, accessed at our website at the uh, email at the uh, web address as you see on, this, on the screen. Next slide. At this point, I'd like to uh, introduce our moderator, my co uh, moderators. Uh, my uh, co-moderator is uh, Ziad, uh, Dr. Ziad Kazi. He's a board member of the American College of Medical Toxicology and president of the Middle East and North African uh, Clinical Toxicology Association, associate professor of emergency medicine at Emory University. Next slide. I'm delighted to uh, introduce uh, our uh, other co-moderator for today, Dr. Laura uh, Tomalin. Uh, she's uh, a vice chair for clinical practice in the Department of Neurology an associate professor of clinical neurology and emergency medicine toxicology at Indiana University School of Medicine, and has the unique uh, distinction of being both a, a neurologist as well as a, a medical toxicologist. And she will be helping out with the, the moderation toward the end of the talk. Next slide. At this point, uh, I'll have Dr. Kazi introduce our speakers. Thank you, Dr. Wax. It's my uh, distinct pleasure to uh, welcome our two speakers today who will discuss the very important topic of COVID-19 neurologic manifestations and global impact on stroke care. Um, our first speaker is going to be Dr. Nirav Bhatt, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at the Marcus Stroke and Neuroscience Center at Grady Memorial Hospital and Emory University School of Medicine. Uh, our second speaker is Dr. Raul Noguera, professor at the Department of Neurology, Emory University School of Medicine, and the director of the Neuroendovascular Service at Marcus Stroke and Neuroscience Center, Grady Memorial Hospital, Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Nira, would you like to please start? Uh, thank you for the kind introduction and uh, thank you again for the invitation. Um, and again, apologize for the delay. Um, all right. Um, um, a disclaimer about um, almost all COVID-19 talks is that information around COVID-19 pandemic is rapidly evolving. Views in this presentation are not meant to be a medical advice as things may change if they haven't already changed by the time we discuss these things. So this is an overview of what I'm going to discuss uh, a little bit. I'll try and share what we know so far amongst the neurology and medical community about COVID-19 disease and the neurological manifestations. And uh, uh, talking about the etiology and pathogenesis, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this model of the COVID-19 uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is implicated in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And it is the seventh uh, virus of the beta coronavirus family with, of which uh, two other viruses have been known to cause widespread disease in, the human, uh, in, in human beings. And uh, the unique property about this virus is this red colored spike protein, which renders it extremely transmissible um, across the animals and human beings um, and makes it very infectious in general. Just to go over what that really means is, imagine this is a spike protein of the virus and this is the ACE2 receptor on the nasal epithelial cell. The virus attaches itself to the ACE2 receptor with the help of the spike protein, leads to binding and internalization and leads to injection of the RNA into the cellular cytoplasm that leads to uh, further replication and um, maturation with the use of intracellular components. And that leads to uh, formation of more viral particles that ultimately undergo exocytosis and release into the environ, 
uh, infecting uh, more cells. In this process, it also uh, potentiates a widespread immune dysfunction and, um, um, and a host of um, inflammation around it, which causes a lot of pathogenesis associated around, along, with this, um, uh, along with this disease. But in a majority of these cases, this infection is contained in the upper respiratory tracts. In some cases, viral re replication and propagation involves the lower airways, and that potentiates a greater immunological response in cytokine storm, leading to further tissue injury and widespread host immune dysfunction. Other places where we find abundance of ACE2 receptors is kidney, blood vessels, heart, digestive tracts, and uh, neuroepithelial cells. So just going over the potential mechanisms of how this viral infection causes neurological manifestations is um, the first mechanism, proposed mechanism is like we just discussed how it causes widespread immune dysfunction, inflammation, and a systemic disease that leads to multi-organ failure, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, other metabolic encephalopathies, coagulopathy, stroke, paradoxical embolism due to coagulopathies, and widespread inflammation causing encephalopathy, other encephalopathies. Like I mentioned, the neuroepithelium can be invaded directly by the virus. It has neurotropism towards uh, some of the epithelial cells, it can, and it can cause viral encephalitis, anosmia, aguasia, myopathies, and cardiomyopathy amongst other myopathies. And finally, the, an immune-mediated mechanism where the viral, viral illness can cause um, a GBS, which is Guillain-Barre syndrome-like illness, uh, which we'll discuss a little bit about it towards the end of this presentation, also causes a pro-inflammatory state causing thrombophilia and can cause uh, increased chances of forming a stroke and microangiopathic changes, which again, increase the chances of ischemic complications in neurological disease. And then finally, destabilization of vascular uh, plaques along the vascular beds, something that we see fairly often in patients with um, large artery atherosclerotic disease like carotid disease and intracranial large artery atherosclerotic disease as well. So some of the first evidence tying uh, this viral infection towards uh, neurological manifestations come from this JAMA neurology paper um, that came from um, three dedicated COVID-19 hospitals in China it was a retrospective study of 214 patients that showed 36% of the patients had neurological complications, so, so pretty high. But we also found that a lot of these patients had nonspecific symptoms, um, and 3% of these patients had stroke. Overall, patients with higher um, disease severity had higher incidence of impaired consciousness and stroke, something that we would have expected. Some of the limitations of the study was that there were no data on outcomes. There was some selection bias and limited investigations. Nonetheless, this was our first experience or this was sort of the first proof that this viral infection could be associated with neurological manifestations. Moving further, there was another study that of 56 COVID-19 treatment centers in China that showed a little less um, incidence of neurological symptoms and again, very commonly encephalopathy, dizziness, headache, which were considered to be non-specific symptoms that can really happen because of infection, inflammation, and overall encephalopathy, encephalopathic stage because of everything that's going on in a patient who is critically ill. Um, we also know that milder forms of neurological symptoms may not have been accurately reported in a lot of these studies. And given the widespread prevalence of COVID-19 by that time, a definite causal relationship could not necessarily be established. However, we do know that less than 1% of the patients presented with stroke in, in that study. Now, talking about stroke, I just want to make sure everybody is on the same page. When we talk about stroke, we talk about um, broad categories of stroke. And the reason why we differentiate these into, into these different categories is that each of these categories are, are really very different and distinct disease uh, diseases by themselves. They have a very distinct um, natural progression of the disease and they are treated very differently as well. So ischemic stroke, which happens because of decreased blood flow to a part of the brain uh, is more commonly, um, occurs more commonly, not only during in, in the COVID-19 pandemic, but also outside the COVID-19 pandemic, which, which is um, about 80% of the strokes are ischemic strokes, about 20% of them are hemorrhagic strokes. 
And uh, if you look at these um, uh, subcategories, you will find that atherothrombotic disease, which is large artery atherosclerotic disease, something that you may have heard about carotid, uh, um, uh, carotid artery disease or intracranial atherosclerotic disease, these all fall into uh, this category. It comprises about 20%. Lacunar stroke, which happens because of small vessel disease, which uh, is usually a manifestation of long-standing vascular risk factors like hypertension, diabetes, happens in about a fourth of ischemic stroke cases. And then cardioembolic disease, which really reflects an embolism, a thrombus forming in the heart that eventually migrates to the brain because brain takes up so much proportion of blood supply by its weight that it is a very um, common site for these clots to get lodged and, and causes stroke as well. Um, when I, as you may notice that cryptogenic stroke does not have a picture. And the reason really for that is cryptogenic stroke really could mean a lot of things. Uh, we call a stroke a cryptogenic stroke when after an extensive evaluation, we either have not found an etiology for the stroke or we have found multiple etiologies that could be competing towards the, uh, towards the development of stroke. And that makes it uh, a little difficult because for, like I mentioned, all these um, etiologies are, or disease pro um, processes are treated very distinctly. And for cryptogenic stroke, we have um, um, far lesser uh, uh, treatment, so to say. And we'll talk a little bit more about this, how this has affected our, in the COVID pandemic. Um, this was one of the studies from uh, Spain that showed about 1% uh, of the patients um, with COVID-19 presented with acute ischemic stroke and uh, much lesser proportion with uh, um, intracranial hemorrhage. The common theme was that they all presented with high D-dimer and high ferritin. Some, some of these are uh, acute phase reactants. Some of these are abnormal coagulation markers. And patients with stroke and COVID-19 had a very high mortality. Median NIH stroke scale was 18. So what that means really is that uh, NIH stroke scale is a, is a stroke severity scale that goes from zero to 42, zero meaning no neurological symptoms and 42 meaning very poor neurological exam. And there are limitations to the NIH stroke scale per se, but it's a fairly reliable marker of how severe the neurological manifestations are. And when we say talk about NIH of 18, NIH stroke scale of 18, that represents a really moderate to severe kind of stroke. Um, another study from New York Health System, again, found a very similar incidence of stroke, more cryptogenic strokes. So remember, we talked about a stroke where we did not find an etiology or we um, found multiple etiologies contributing and um, conflicting etiologies that could have potentially led to the development of stroke. And again, high NIH stroke scales, high D-dimers. And by that time, there was some evidence that um, patients with COVID-19 and abnormal bio, uh, coagulation markers were associated with a higher mortality. And there were some expert consensus uh, suggestions that uh, perhaps utilizing high dose anticoagulation or therapeutic anticoagulation in those patients may reduce mortality. And uh, while it was not backed by large um, um, guideline-based evidences, but a lot of institutions, including this institution, had implemented some, some similar sort of structured anticoagulation in, their, in, in, in those patients. This is another similar study, and uh, it has very similar characteristics, but the unique thing about the study, again, is a very high proportion of patients had large vessel occlusion, so which really means patients had very high um, morbidity and mortality. And uh, th this study reported patients um, with brain biopsies that showed evidence of endotheliopathy. Similarly, this was uh, another uh, multi-center collaboration by the Society of Vascular and Interventional Neurology in which a lot of our group members also participated in the study. It was a study of more than 14,000 patients in 31 hospitals across four countries that again found very similar incidences of stroke and a higher proportion of cryptogenic strokes, higher cryptogenic strokes associated with a higher mortality. And overall, uh, patients in the 60 to 80, 79 group range did very, did, did very poorly in terms of mortality.
Now, how does this really um, compare itself with the influenza pandemic? So this group of researchers from New York actually were able to compare the, some of the effects of um, uh, COVID-19 and stroke, ischemic stroke specifically, uh, with the influenza pandemic that occurred about a decade ago, more than a decade ago. And what the striking, striking thing was, the rates of ischemic stroke in COVID-19 patients were 7.6 times higher than that of influenza infection. So really a very distinct, um, oh, very distinct infection, so to say. Again, higher D-dimer amongst COVID-19 patients and um, a, 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 amongst COVID-19 patients who had stroke as compared to COVID-19 uh, stroke patients without COVID-19 infection. Now, this was the broad overview of the incidence and characteristics of stroke. If you look at the granular data, you will find that not all strokes were because of the overall sickness of the patients. You, um, this was one of the very first data that came out from New York. Again, that was published as a letter in New England Journal. They showed that they, they, they encountered five patients who were relatively younger, less than 50 years of age. Stroke is usually an, a, a disease of the elderly, but relatively younger patients who presented with large vessel occlusion in a two week period. That was very atypical for them. Etiology remained cryptogenic in all of them. All of these patients underwent mechanical thrombectomy and most of them had elevated D-dimers and underwent anticoagulation. Similarly, this is an article in radiology that shows the presence of this clot in the lumen of the internal carotid artery, which is fairly atypical for something like that to happen in absence of underlying atherosclerotic disease that again points whether there is something to do with COVID-19 endotheliopathy and inflammation that is resulting in, just in strokes. Um, uh, what about our experience? Now, here we are showing um, uh, what we call intraluminal thrombus formation. This is a fairly uncommon cause of stroke outside the pandemic, and it usually occurs um, secondary to underlying atherosclerotic lesions you may be able to appreciate these are the internal carotid arteries and you can already see a filling defect in the inter internal carotid artery which represents a free floating clot uh, um, again uh, which shows the intraluminal thrombosis again all these patients had high d-dimers and crp and they were associated with most of them were associated with severe disability in a, in these patients now, what do we know about D-dimers? I've mentioned D-dimers several times, but we do know that stroke is associated with a modest elevation of D-dimers. It has not necessarily led to what we routinely do in terms of long-term management of these strokes. But we do know now that higher D-dimer level in COVID-19 infection has been associated with worse mortality outcomes and is also associated with a higher risk of venous thromboembolism in these patients. So um, uh, in the earlier part of pandemic, um, because of these um, um, observations, there were some expert consensus guidelines considering, uh, rec suggesting that it may be reasonable to consider short-term thromboprophylaxis in patients who have abnormal coagulation markers and COVID-19 infection to perhaps uh, reduce their mortality and perhaps also reduce their ICU stay. However, they left it saying that decisions regarding antithrombotic regimen need to be individualized based on patient's condition and practitioner's assessment of risks versus benefits. So as neurologists, the, to us, the highest and most fearsome risk of anticoagulation, systemic anticoagulation, is the eye inter, um, intracranial hemorrhage occurrence. And that a lot of times can be devastating. It has very few treatment options and it is um, it, it can a lot of times it can be fatal as well. So when we consider individual treatment options, we always want to consider what are the bleeding risks versus what are the clotting risks in a particular patient. Some of the things that can represent or uh, show a bleeding risk is the patient age, stroke size and the age of stroke bleeding diathesis um, or CKD. On the other hand, cl clotting risks include clot burden, abnormal coagulation markers, illness severity, so on and so forth. Now, what about non-vascular neurological complications? So we've all heard about anosmia and dysquasia, which is 
inability to smell and inability to taste. And that usually happens because what we think is neurotropism towards olfactory epithelial cells. And these uh, deficits may, be, may mark a very early infection in these patients. Uh, like I mentioned, immune-mediated um, uh, manifestations, um, something called Miller-Fisher syndrome, which is a triad of ophthalmoplegia, which is abnormal eye movements, ataxia, and nystagmus. Again, it is immune-mediated, typically happens after uh, bacterial infections, but several cases uh, associated with COVID, COVID exposure have also been shown. Um, encephalopathies, like I mentioned, because of the widespread systemic inflammation, different kind of encephalopathies have been reported. As you can see over here, supratentorial uh, confluent flare hyperintensities, some enhancing um, uh, on post-contrast enhancement, um, uh, very similar to what we find in ADEM or acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis. Similarly, this is a picture of a patient who presented with what we call left medial temporal hyperintensity that happens in a lot of viral infections. It is actually very pathognomic in appropriate clinical context of an HSV infection. And that has also been shown in along with um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 exposure. And the other cases are, um, um, are patients with, uh, who presented with what look like demyelinating lesions as well. Subcortical hemorrhagic, uh, necrotizing and necrotizing encephalopathy has also been described. And finally, patients who have hypertension and uh, renal failure are at risk of developing what is known as posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. Um, other neuromuscular complications, again, uh, ophthalmoparesis from multiple cranial nerve palsies has, has also been reported. Guillain-Barre syndrome has been reported in several cases. And one case, one uh, case series from Italy, it was again a letter that described new onset acetylcholine receptor antibody positive myasthenia gravis um, in a setting of recent COVID infection. Although the direct causality is hard to establish, but uh, was reported in that, um, in that case series. And worsening of previous neuromuscular diseases have also been described. So as you can imagine, people with neuromuscular diseases are at already at risk of developing respiratory failure. And on top of that, you are introducing uh, COVID-19, which is a highly infectious and a highly pathogenic um, virus, for, mainly for the respiratory system. And it can obviously, um, impact tremendously in patients who have neuromuscular disease. Um, finally, um, I would like, I'm not an expert in vaccine at all by any means, but I would like to talk a little bit about the new um, mRNA-based vaccine. This is the first time an mRNA-based vaccine has been used in any disease. And it was, um, as you all may know it, um, 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 two mRNA-based vaccines were, um, rolled out in the middle of December under EUA, Emergency Utilization Authorization. Both vaccines in clinical trials have shown remarkable efficacy in preventing severe COVID-19 illness, and both are administered as two intramuscular injections three to four weeks apart. Bell's palsy has been reported in amongst participants in both the vaccine trials, although the frequency was less than 0.1% in both the vaccine studies. And according to CDC, this rate is not higher than that of general population. Post-marketing surveillance will give us more data about what to make out of the uh, low, very low risk of Bell's palsy in these patients. And then this has been a very long-standing discussion about the uh, potential of vaccination causing Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, there was, um, um, there have been a lot of papers uh, implicating influenza vaccination flu shots with Guillain-Barre syndromes. Small studies have although showed a possible association of GBS with the COVID-19 infection like we talked about, but no cases have been detected so far that link to GBS to the mRNA COVID vaccination. According to CDC, people with history of GBS may still receive the mRNA vaccine. And although this was an interim analysis, but you may have heard about reports of transverse myelitis in non-mRNA vaccine trials. Finally, to summarize, um, COVID-19 infection has been known to has been shown to be associated with a wide range of neurological conditions. It is also associated with a moderate risk of acute ischemic stroke. 
and a substantial proportion of these patients of with acute ischemic stroke are cryptogenic and associated with poor outcome. And secondary prevention of these patients should be individualized. One size does not fit all. And mRNA vaccines, so, uh, as we know so far, carry a very low risk of neurological complications. And finally, this is a public um, uh, advisory by CDC to continue to wear a mask, stay six feet apart, avoid crowds, and I would add, keep washing your hands um, before every encounter. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, um, Dr. Noguera, who will be talking about the um, uh, impact of uh, COVID-19 on uh, stroke care. Thank you so much, Dr. Bud. This was an excellent presentation. We appreciate all the data that you presented, and we look forward uh, to the Q&A session. Please continue to type in your Q&A, uh, your questions in the Q&A box. And now we will listen to Dr. Noguera's presentation. It's a great pleasure to present our research on the global impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on stroke care. Here are my disclosures. I would like to acknowledge everyone that has collaborated for this global effort, uh, specifically Tan Yu and Mustafa Qureshi from Boston University who worked with me in the data analysis. I think the first question you need to understand is that there are at least three mechanisms how COVID-19 could injure stroke patients. The first one is the viral infection itself, the most obvious mechanism through either the potential neurotropism of the viral or the different inflammatory immunological and coagulation disorders. We now know that some patients, specifically young patients without vascular risk factors have been reported to be directly affected by the virus, probably through endothelial cell infection and inflammation triggering uh, the development of uh, intravascular thrombos like this carotid thrombos with a stroke, same thing can happen in the coronary bed. The second type of uh, uh, injury mechanism is actually spread of misinformation, something that you have called infodemic, where opinions uh, are becoming facts, opinions not based on, on good scientific data become guidelines. And here is a good example, uh, this opinion statement from two uh, very good professional societies essentially stating that you should consider intubating more patients prior to thrombectomy and stroke, specifically those patients with dominant hemisphere occlusions and NIH stroke scale equal greater than 15, this was the case for the Society of uh, Neuroanesthesia, also the Neurointerventional Surgery Society. Uh, when you look at our own experience in over 1,500 patients, we didn't see that either of these things, dominant hemisphere or NIH stroke scale equal greater than 15, predict conversion from monitor anesthesia care to general endot endotracheal anesthesia. More importantly, this recent paper here suggests that during the pandemic, as a potential consequence of these guidelines, more patients are getting intubated, over 50% in this multinational series here. And as a consequence of that, okay, we had a prolongation in the dorsal reperfusion time, higher in hospital mortality, and, and a lower likelihood of good outcome at the time of discharge. There was only 1% of conversion from a MAC anesthesia to general endotracheal anesthesia, and only 2.8% of our patients were COVID positive. So you see like rapid uh, incorporation of guidelines not well founded in scientific data potentially hurting patients. But this is the topic you wanna discuss today, what I believe is the most dramatic problem. It's actually the COVID-19 collateral damage, even in no COVID-19 uh, stroke patients. I'm going to start here with some U.S. data. Uh, we saw some early alerts uh, using artificial intelligence. This is something that was done through the RAPID system where they documented a 39% decline in the using of stroke imaging early in the pandemic. That kind of recovered a little bit, was a short period, but we then did a, a, a longer analysis where you compare March 1st to May 10th with the period prior to the pandemic. And we did that uh, across 97 US hospitals throughout 20 states. We incorporate data from over 23,000 patients. The difference here is we could not only look at CTA and CTP, but you also had automated detection of large vessel occlusions, okay, which happened in 
of the cases. So using the VIS analytics system, what you can see here as the COVID deaths went up, you had a big drop in the uh, number of per hospital per day CTAs that you were done. And you can see how this correlates very well. Here in red, you have the over uh, 2,500 cases that actually had large vessel occlusion. Then you can see that the same phenomenon applies, although in a much less scale. When you look at the reduction um, fact, you have almost 23% reduction in relation to the pandemic in terms of any neuroimage that was performed in the system. And you had a reduction of 17.1% in the amount of large vessel occlusion that was detected. One thing that uh, came from this analysis that you thought was very interesting is you could correlate the amount of LVO that was detected with the system and its drop with the amount of mechanical thrombectomies that it was done in the entire region in the state of Georgia that utilizes this, this, the system. And you can see a great correlation. In fact, the number of LVO CTA positive dropped by almost 19% as did the number of mechanical thrombectomy in, the, in that region, essentially suggesting that you can use the system to gauge the impact of any problems in systems of care in terms of what's going to happen with mechanical thrombectomy. So bringing AI to the surveillance of stroke. We also did some research looking at the United States, uh, both stroke and MI, MI care. There was, this was a retrospective observational study. We then compared the immediately preceding months, January to February, with the peak months of the pandemic in West, March uh, through April. And what you can see here is as we start in January 2019 and you come to the pandemic months, you see a rapid decline in this trend of the number of acute ischemic stroke volumes in the United States, you also see a marked decline in intravenous thrombolysis and mechanical thrombectomy. And both uh, acute ischemic stroke and intravenous thrombolysis actually reach statistically significance if you look at the trends. Mechanical thrombectomy, be probably because the numbers are smaller, didn't. But then what you could do is then compare the March, April months of the pandemic with the same period the year prior. And here you could document a 39% decline in the number of stroke hospitalizations, a 30% decline in the volume for intravenous thrombolysis and a 23.5% decline in the volume for mechanical thrombectomy across uh, the pre-pandemic and pandemic periods. Another data that was fascinating here is when you look at outcomes in acute ischemic stroke patients, again, comparing the same period across 2019 and 2020, we notice a 41% higher inpatient mortality in, in the acute ischemic stroke patients that were hospitalized. So COVID has not only affect the, the quantity of care, but potentially the quality of the care as well. Uh, having said that, um, the length of uh, hospitalization stay was lower, 17% lower, and that uh, decreased hospitalization cost at by 12%, which kind of tells us that potentially you can be a little more efficient in the future, uh, because it looks like when you got pushed to shorten the length of stay due to the pandemics, you could do it, and you could do it relatively well, although uh, the question about uh, quality of care remains with the higher in hospital mortality. Moving on to MI, which is another emergency that you need to consider, you can see again, pretty stable as you go from January 19 all the way to the early pandemic period when you have this abrupt decline, both in the number of acute MI hospitalizations as well as coronary intervention, both from being uh, significant as you can see here. When you look at 2019, 2020 for the same March, April period, you can see a 39% decline in the number of acute MI hospitalizations. So pretty much the same thing you had with stroke and a 35% decline in the volume of coronary intervention. So pretty, uh, pretty uh, remarkable. And again, paralleling what you saw in acute stroke here. 
um, differently than acute ischemic stroke. There was no change in hospital mortality in acute MI, probably because this is a more mature system. But again, you saw a lower hospitalization uh, length as well as a lower hospitalization cost by about 20%. Now moving on to the global data, and uh, here you're gonna start with analysis of comprehensive stroke centers and mechanical thrombectomy. How this is gonna be cross-section observational retrospective analysis. And specifically for mechanical thrombectomy, you had data from six continents, 40 countries, and a total of 187 comprehensive centers. Here is what you did in terms of our primary and secondary analysis. Starting with our primary analysis, you are here comparing the three months period at the initial height of the pandemic, March through May of 2020, with the immediately preceding months. Okay, and you're gonna look at overall volume through these three months, as well as monthly volume through these four months. And when you plot the data, Across the several weeks here, you can see the early peak uh, in China, then the big global peak. As this big global peak happens, you can see a March market decline in the amount of ischemic strokes that were admitted to the hospitals, as well as a decline in the number of ICHs. Moving on to the quantification, overall there was a 19% decline okay, in the amount of admissions that happened to stroke centers in relation to the pandemia, this remained stable even after you adjusted for peak uh, of locality. And this is something very interesting. You can see that there is a variation according to the hospital COVID-19 volume, where hospitals that had higher volume of the uh, COVID-19 uh, disease had higher rates of decline. When you look at hospital stroke volume, uh, you can see that, patients that places that had lower volume suffered a little less than places that had higher volume, probably because these centers became default uh, centers also for COVID-19 care. Moving on to hosp stroke hospitalization by continent, you can see that this pretty much affect all the continents with some degree of variation, okay? And this remains significant pretty much everywhere. It is a map of uh, this phenomenon across the world. Now moving on to mechanical thrombectomy, what you can see here again is the peak of COVID, and then you see that the remarkable drop in the amount of th mechanical thrombectomy around the same period. Quantifying this globally, you had almost a 13% drop in the volumes of mechanical thrombectomy that remain statistically significant after adjustments for different in peaks across the different countries. And the same thing you see here, higher COVID volume hospitals suffer more. When you look at this effect by continent, it's pretty much widespread uh, throughout all the continents. Looking at the secondary analysis, here you are comparing the three months at the hype of the pandemic with the same period in 2019. No surprises, you could see similar drops in stroke admissions, mechanical thrombectomy, ischemic stroke, and ICH hospitalization. Um, were all um, tend to be statistically significant uh, even after adjustments uh, with the exception of things that you had lower volume like mechanical thrombectomy and intracranial hemorrhage. Moving on to intravenous thrombolysis, very similar methodology here. You had six continents, 70 countries, 457 stroke centers, including both primary and, and comprehensive stroke centers this time. Results of the primary analysis here. You see the graph again showing rising COVID with drop in stroke admissions throughout these primary and comprehensive stroke centers. The drop in stroke admissions across all these centers was almost 12%, statistically significant. And you can see here uh, the difference uh, in the monthly volumes also statistically significant. You see the effect that it's pretty consistently in terms of COVID-19 volume. Um, you see higher volumes, bigger drops. And in terms of stroke hospitalization volume, 
that kind of varies with the biggest drops being at the intermediate, intermediate volume group, as you see here. The volume was seen at volume drop was seen at both primary and comprehensive centers, but was uh, more important at primary than comprehensive centers. And this was a statistically significant difference across these two types of hospitals. Again, affected our continents. Um, and uh, moving on now to intravenous thrombolysis, same phenomenon, COVID goes up, intravenous thrombolysis goes down. By how much? Uh, about 13% was the drop. And again, it was a function of COVID hospitalization, higher COVID hospitalization volumes, uh, bigger drops in intravenous thrombolysis with, again, the intermediate hospitals getting the largest drop and the drop at primary centers being greater than at comprehensive stroke centers with statistical significance difference. Here is intravenous thrombolysis by continent. Again, every continent got affected. Uh, here is a look at stroke care over the pandemic, right? You see uh, when you compare now the early pandemic with the late pandemic, you had four months, right? Starting March, April, May, and June. If you compare March, April with May and June, we can see a sign of recovery, almost 10% recovery, which was significant. Okay, and then the recover the is actually proportional, uh, right? The, uh, the COVID-19 COVID hospitalization status. So some some so early sure. evidence that you may be recovering from this. Secondary analysis, no surprise. If you compare with the same time in the previous year, you still see um, the same drop in volumes. Uh, finally, some relationships between COVID and 19 that are of interest. So if you ask, what is the proportion of patients with COVID-19 that also have a diagnosis of stroke? The answer is about 1.5%. So 1.5% of all patients with COVID-19 will also have the diagnosis of a stroke uh, during the hospitalization stay. This varies depending on the continent, but again, staying always less than 3%. When you ask the different question of, when you look at the proportion of all stroke patients, how many of those will also be diagnosed with COVID-19 during the hospitalization? That's about 3.3% with a greater variation across continents getting to close to 9% in South America. Just to finalize a little bit on subarachnoid hemorrhage and aneurysm volumes, uh, here you look at six continents, 37 countries, 140 stroke centers, similar relationships, COVID goes up, both SAH admissions and aneurysm rupture, aneurysm embolization goes down by how much? 22% drop in uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage admissions and about 11.5% drop in the number of aneurysms that were embolized in relation to the pandemic versus pre-pandemic periods. So I think to finalize, it's important that you understand there is a relationship between COVID-19 and strokes where there is a direct causation, but that's relatively rare, okay? And more commonly, patients you have strokes and COVID-19 at the same time, just because this is an overlap of two common conditions. But the biggest problem of the pandemics in relation to stroke is actually this collateral damage. So to conclude, the COVID-19 collateral damage on stroke care is an indisputable fact with global distribution across all continents that we study here. It affects a wide spectrum of cerebrovascular disorders and other emergencies, including acute myocardial infarction. It's potentially improved, improving as we are adapting to this new reality. And AI and big data analytics might be of uh, beneficial in the surveillance uh, of this phenomenon. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much for this nice presentation. I'm going to turn it over now for the Q&A session. Hi, everyone. Thank you both so much for um, an excellent presentation on both the direct and indirect effects of this pandemic on stroke care and neurologic care in general. Um, we have quite a few questions in the Q&A, so I'm gonna try to group them together by topic a little bit. Um, so we'll start with, um, you mentioned that there was a higher incidence of stroke with COVID than 
um, in comparison to influenza and other viruses? Um, is, is there any evidence that there is a higher degree of severity or different features of stroke with COVID than with uh, other viral associated ischemic events? Um, so I can answer that um, uh, question, I can take that question. Um, so uh, the paper that I had referenced um, mainly talked about uh, comparison between the COVID-19 and influenza related strokes. And um, uh, one of the things about that was um, we did definitely find that patients with COVID-19 strokes had a lot of lot more baseline vascular risk factors, including age, hypertension, and other comorbidities. Um, they certainly presented with a high NIH stroke scale, and they were certainly associated with a higher rate of mortality than COVID-19 patients who did not have um, uh, stroke as well. And that mortality kind of also reflects on the patients who had a, more than patients who had um, strokes with influenza. So yes, they may be more severe. Uh, however, they do mention that um, when they controlled for all the vascular risk factors, uh, their, their stroke-related uh, morbidity and mortality was still higher in COVID-19 patients with acute ischemic stroke. Uh, so while there may be uh, some relation, we have to remember that this was a uh, um, a historical comparison between the influenza-related strokes and the COVID-19 strokes. So we do not have direct comparisons. Uh, thank you. Um, in follow-up to that, um, you referenced that 1.6% um, of COVID patients have stroke. Can you speak to the time frame of those strokes? Is it typically at presentation? Is it at a certain point in their illness, during hospitalization, in the ICU? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, in, in these studies, uh, the time frames have been fairly um, disparate. Um, it, we have to remember that first, we do not have any data on um, recurrence of strokes once the patients are, are discharged. So most of these studies were studies of inpatient uh, COVID-19 patients who experienced stroke while they were inpatient. Depending uh, on the COVID severity of the COVID-19 illness, they may have stayed there, stayed in the hospital for a variable length of time. And um, as far as um, um, the time frames are concerned. Uh, in my review of literature, there have been varied time frames starting from very early in the first few hours to few days, to even going up to all the way up to two to three weeks after their initial exposure. That being said, um, we also have encountered some patients who present to us as strokes and they were incidentally found to be COVID-19 patients. Uh, were uh, infected with COVID-19. So, you know, it kind of goes both ways. Um, and as of now, we don't have a real good idea about the timeline. Um, any thoughts on the impact of steroids on COVID and stroke? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. Um, so far, uh, you know, it, it, it's a good theoretical um, hypothesis that steroids can calm down the infection, can subside the infection, and can potentially mitigate some of the um, uh, some of the ill effects of the of the generalized inflammation in the body. Um, but we also have to remember that um, when patients are severely ill. Um, uh, they, they putting them on steroids can also put them at a higher risk of developing other infections. So currently, we do not have good data to suggest um, routine use of steroids uh, in patients who have um, a stroke and COVID-19 infection. Patients who have been on, there are some uh, anecdotal and some case reports about patients who have been on immunosuppressive therapies, especially steroids for their uh, autoimmune conditions, neurological conditions. In them, the current guidance is to continue those steroids, perhaps considering stress dose steroids. But again, these, these are very limited studies. Um, you referenced the uh, anticoagulation guidelines and the relative um, sort of nonspecific way that they're encouraged. Yeah. 
Um, does your hospital or health system have a standard approach to COVID patients and prophylactic anticoagulation? You know, so this is a very dynamic process and um, uh, things have been changing very fast. Um, what we have adopted is uh, sort of, uh, there, there is always a guidance about um, what to do in patients with, um, uh, with COVID-19 infection and abnormal coagulation markers. But like I said, as neurologists, we always fear about the, the risk of intracerebral hemorrhage. In tricky situations or in cases we, where we are not 100% sure, uh, and you know, because of limited data, we, we are in, in, in those situations fairly often, we usually seek multidisciplinary guidance with, uh, with hematologists, with other specialties, and then have a discussion about risks versus benefits with the family. So again, um, it, it's, it's, um, it's the time of individualized medicine more so than ever. And uh, you know, one size definitely doesn't fit all in these cases. I think our hospital order set has a Lovenox 30 or 40 milligrams BID as the default, but um, <laughs> all of the asterisks that you just put on it, yes. um, we certainly change uh, from the default on a fairly regular basis. Um, so to ask a little bit about the stroke systems of care topic, um, a couple of questions about, um, do you think that shorter hospitalizations and less costly admissions um, due to deaths uh, helped uh, cause the decreased length of stay and expense associated? So uh, that's the US data uh, from the premier database. And, and the short answer is no, okay? Because that also happened with acute myocardial infarction where there was not an increase of uh, uh, in-hospital mortality, right? So the, the, the drop in the hospitalization length of stay and the, the drop in costs uh, were dissociated from that. Moreover, even though there was a significant uh, uh, increase in mortality in stroke patients, if you look at the uh, um, proportion of the patients that actually have in hospital mortality from stroke, it's still relatively low to actually have such uh, an impact. I think what, uh, what happened is uh, due to several factors, right? You, you need to become more efficient. Uh, you need to open up more beds in order to uh, be able to handle the COVID patients. Uh, you didn't want to keep patients in the hospitals for, for too long and increase their exposure uh, to potential uh, COVID patients. Uh, I think uh, as we have seen wars, right? Sometimes you need to take a step back and see what is the good in that bad situation. And I think that may be one of the messages. It's like, maybe you can be more efficient than you typically are. Uh, and uh, um, you probably want other studies to validate our findings uh, that have yet to be published but uh, seem to be uh, uh, pretty significant uh, in that analysis. Uh, it, it really looks like when you were pushed to be more efficient and decrease hospital length of stay uh, during a moment of crisis, you were able to do so. So why not learn uh, from that experience and be more efficient and decrease health healthcare costs from now on? But uh, the mortality in the stroke side may have contributed some to this, but uh, it's not the, the main explanation uh, by any stretch, because again, we saw that with MI and that was proportionally a very small portion of the overall uh, uh, hospitalization on patients. Thank you. A um, couple of questions about vaccines and patients with um, neurologic conditions. Um, are the data that we have so far sufficient to help you form a recommendation about which vaccine you would recommend for patients who have a history of autoimmune or autoimmune neurologic conditions? So like I mentioned, I'm by no means a vaccine expert. Um, you know, at that point, I would have to consult a, a person who has way more knowledge than I do uh, about vaccines in general and um, underlying conditions and how they impact vaccinations. 
I personally um, would not have, do not have enough experience to recommend one versus the other. The state health department here has um, sort of informally asked for our thoughts on it and our, our thoughts were very generic, um, but um, it certainly included the observation as you pointed out in detail that COVID itself is associated with a significant degree of, of neurologic disease, obviously, or we wouldn't be having this webinar. And so um, while there may be some neurologic risks from the vaccine that we just haven't elucidated yet, um, we know for sure that there are neurologic complications of the disease. Um, and so that certainly has to be factored in. I think, uh, Laura, for this one, uh, I, uh, I urge our public health uh, participants to really focus on this type of communication. This is important. This is why people uh, would probably refuse to get a vaccine. It's these type of reports of Guillain-Barre that have been reported with other vaccinations. I think uh, for vaccine acceptance purposes, communicating clearly and intelligently about this issue is key. Yeah, I would agree. And uh, I think we're gonna have more and more patients asking this question as the vaccine distribution spreads um, from healthcare workers to the general public. Um, we have a set of questions about um, the encephalopathy associated with COVID disease. Um, are there any features of it that make it different from encephalopathy from any other systemic illness? Um, do, do we know much about the duration, recovery, any potential treatments, and how should we treat it differently from uh, other similar conditions? Yeah, so um, one of the limitation of uh, understanding encephalopathy better is, uh, is in general, um, encephalopathy is a reflection of what e everything else that is going on in the body. And um, we now definitely know that patients who are uh, infected with a severe um, COVID disease tend to be in the ICU longer, tend to have a more severe disease, tend to have multi-organ failure. And these all things um, uh, ultimately culminate into encephalopathy. Um, that being said, um, other things like delirium and uh, altered mental status has been shown in even in, in the report um, that, you know, you may not always have a typical signs and symptoms of an underlying infection as you would expect in any other bacterial infection um, that would have otherwise caused encephalopathy. So just to say that patients, um, uh, as it affects, um, uh, it, as it can potentially affect um, older patients, they may not have enough immunity to mount uh, uh, an immunological response to have febrile illness, or other, or like leukocytosis, some of the things that we usually look at to monitor the degree of um, systemic disturbance that could contribute to the encephalopathy. I, I think just to complement that, I think we need to be very careful. Um, there is definitely a lot of uh, neurological uh, entities that can happen in this setting of COVID, but. Uh, the vast majority of them are uh, just in a specific things that happen with any severe infection or with uh, uh, multiple organ failure, uh, even strokes, right? So if you look, that there are papers demonstrating that the uh, incidence of uh, strokes uh, after something like a severe sepsis in an ICU patient, it's not much different than what you see in COVID patients, right? So um, uh, yes, you have seen cases of uh, Guillain-Barre transverse myelitis, but uh, is, it, is it a lot more common than what you have seen with other entities, right? Uh, uh, with, with other virus? Um, uh, we don't really know that. And uh, typically when there is a novelty, uh, there is a new disease, we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, report bias, right? We tend to associate things. And uh, I think that uh, one of the final slides that I really want to, to discuss about when we, we, we talk about COVID and stroke or any neurological disorders is, yes, COVID can occasionally 
have a causation association with strokes. And those are the patients that uh, were reported out of Mount Sinai, typically young patients, no vascular risk factors that out of the blue um, uh, uh, develop uh, 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 endoluminal, interluminal clots, okay, with no underlying atherosclerosis, with no vascular risk factors. And that happens, that, that's extremely rare though. Uh, we expected a, a bump in the amount of thrombectomies and reperfusion treatments that you were going to do during the pandemic, because early on there were a lot of talk about this. We actually saw the contrary. We saw a big drop, right? And people with really severe diseases, they may come to the hospital delayed, but they still tend to come to the hospital. The bulk of the drop in stroke care that we saw actually comes from minor strokes and TIAs. There is a drop in, in the more severe strokes as I demonstrated by, by thrombectomy, but if you see it's always less than the overall, right? And I think the bulk of what you see in terms of stroke and, and associations with neurological disorders is just the overlap of two common diseases, right? COVID now it's very common. We're in the middle of a pandemic and stroke has always been common. So you're gonna see them uh, together. It doesn't mean that there is a, a causation um, of COVID on stroke uh, in, in the vast majority of the cases. Uh, that's actually not in the case. This is a specific entity that happens probably due to endothelial infection, inflammation, and the whole prothrombotic diathesis that uh, is triggered by that but that's not uh, the case for most of the, those patients. And the patients that have that entity, yes, they tend to do a lot worse, uh, even with acute uh, reperfusion treatment and aggressive treatment. I think the toxicologists on the call will especially appreciate the distinction between causation and association. And I, I think you're exactly right. There's a lot that's unknown and I actually, in my practice observed that the novelty of this circumstance and the associated stressors of the pandemic that every single one of us are feeling every day impacts our ability to assess the encephalopathy, the headaches, the more subjective symptoms that our patients have in persistence and, uh, and, and helping us manage those things. Um, I think we have one uh, last question and it has to do whether you have observed hospital systems needing to change their um, post TPA protocols in where patients go when ICU beds are um, at, at a, as a critical resource. Uh, the, the short answer is yes, absolutely. It all depends on, on the uh, in local incidence of the disease, I think in some of my slides, you could see that when we, we did this research, we stratified centers by the incidence of COVID uh, in trials by uh, also stroke volumes, mechanical thrombectomy volumes. So, so different systems will do different things. Um, I think uh, one of the classic examples that we have is the, the one from Barcelona in the first uh, wave of the, the pandemic. Uh, as you all know, they were one of the, the epicenters of the disease, and they actually had to create two hospitals. So they, they had a COVID hospital and um, uh, a non-COVID hospital, and they create a stroke uh, a center within the COVID hospital and kept the other stroke center in the non-COVID hospital to really separate things out. Um, uh, because the incidence of the disease was, was uh, uh, so high, right? But obviously in places where you don't have such a high volumes, you don't need things that are as dramatic as that. Uh, and Dr. Nogueira, I wanna ask a follow-up question on the previous question. Is there a um, uh, need or is, it, is there currently a, a, a pr program looking at all these patients that are the TIAs or the minor strokes that stayed home like what do we do about them is anyone trying to do something about these people that stayed home and not come in uh, that, that's a great question um, and the, the short answer is yes uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, campaigns for public education you no know, don't don't stay home right uh, if you have a stroke or, or an mi please don't stay home you uh, um, 
I, I've seen that like all over the place, uh, yeah, uh, US and all US, uh, uh, because all these papers have really brought a lot of uh, awareness about this problem. Uh, people are not coming to the hospital potentially due to fear of um, not getting good care or acquiring um, the, the coronavirus. Um, there is also uh, a, a potential hypothesis here that some of these diseases may actually have just dropping incidence as well because uh, people are less stressed or uh, there are less polluants out there. And, and I, I just think you need to be open mind to all the possibilities. I think it's gonna take some time for us to actually digest the data. Wonderful. And then my, my last question, if it's okay, if I turn it over to Dr. Dr. Wax, is about the um, cryptogenic uh, strokes. I, and one of our participants asked that question, and I, I think it's also fascinating. What is the usual workup of a cryptogenic stroke? And let's say oh, you find sorry, no it cause. Looks like I was mute. No, I heard you. No, we heard you. Doc. Oh, oh, please go I ahead. Heard. If you start with it, it's. it's no, we sorry. heard you. I was talking and just realized I was mute. <laughs> no, I thought we, I thought you answered that question. I had a follow-up question regarding cryptogenic strokes, and whether um, are they evaluated differently? So once you don't find a cause, uh, and. Is yeah. COVID, uh, uh, you need to check for COVID, you know, what do you do about these cases? So, of so cryptogenic stroke is, um, is, an, is an area of interest um, for a lot, a lot amongst us. And um, um, depending on the characteristic of the patients, whether the patient is a young patient, whether the patient is an old, uh, belongs to an older age group, we sort of tailor our, uh, our um, uh, work up according to that, obviously outside of the pandemic. Uh, some of the things that we look for, if uh, they are younger patients, we want to look, make sure that this is not a genetic cause of uh, their stroke. Then if they are uh, so, sort of in the middle age, we still look for hypercoagulable conditions and COVID really fulfills some of those, um, uh, some of those criteria of being hypercoagulable as well. And finally, uh, cryptogenic stroke is a big umbrella. Um, it also includes this entity which has surfaced very recently. It's called ESAS, which is embolic stroke of undetermined source. And that has its own ban uh, diagnostic workup uh, protocol by itself that includes uh, transesophageal echo echocardiogram and oftentimes um, prolonged cardiac monitoring with either uh, some something like a Holter monitor or um, a loop recorder. Obviously, this is to detect, uh, this is to cast a wider net to detect uh, things like atrial fibrillation. Um, but that's that's in a nutshell uh, for, for workup of cryptogenic strokes. Um, we tend, we want to make sure that we are not missing things like um, non-stenosing um, um, uh, um, atherotic plaques or non-stenosing atherosclerotic lesions that could have potentially caused strokes that have not been that that uh, you know that that have not been earlier detected uh, on conventional studies so yes it involves a little bit more extensive uh, testing but depending on the characteristics including the patient's age and other uh, uh, clinical characteristics we sort of uh, tailor our management according to what we think could be potential uh, causes. Thank you. That's all I have, Dr. Laura or Dr. Wax. Okay, uh, great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'll just go to the next slide. I'd, I'd like to thank our speakers and our guest moderators uh, today for really a, a superb uh, presentation, very uh, timely, uh, very, very useful information. And, and thanks for all the attendees for uh, uh, putting in your questions. Uh, uh, this was uh, you know, quite an uh, excellent uh, uh, presentation and, and it's been recorded and it will show up in, um, on our website in two days and everyone will get a notification about that. Uh, finally, uh, all our uh, prior webinars uh, and the upcoming webinars can be found on our prospectus, which is uh, on our website. Uh, thank you again for attending. Uh, everyone have a good day.